With this, I hand over no to Dr. Paul Galvin yeah, from Tyndall. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Galvin uh, from the Tyndall Massachusetts in Cork in Ireland. Um, I'm head of what we call the ICT for Health Strategic Programs in Tyndall, and I also head up a research group here in Tyndall. In, in Tyndall, uh, Tyndall is an ICT research center focusing on photonics, electronics, uh, materials, and so within that, about 20% of the activity is uh, focused on medtech and uh, health-related applications, working with the leading medtech and pharma companies uh, globally. So our key enabling technologies, what we are really good at are photonics, microelectronics, and smart systems. Uh, and then we leverage those into technology platforms, literally going from atoms to systems ranging from molecular modeling and at an atom, atomistic modeling. Uh, we have advanced sensors, electrochemical, optical, magnetic, uh, and so on that we develop in-house and, and integrate. We have advanced processing, uh, a wafer fabrication facility uh, that goes to uh, uh, 15 centimeter and, and soon to be 20 centimeter uh, wafers, uh, both for silicon and 3.5 materials and, and a whole range of other processes. We have a very strong micropower capability around uh, magnetic sun silicon and other uh, energy harvesting type uh, applications. We have a large uh, photonics capability, uh, a, a photonics integration center, a uh, little bit like uh, the center that John just described for MedTech, but this is focused on photonics across all the applications, including MedTech. So this includes uh, micro optics. Uh, capabilities growing new types of light sources and detectors, photonics integration. Uh, we are one of the probably the leading uh, center in Europe on photonics integration, hosting uh, uh, Europe's uh, picks up uh, pilot line for photonics integration, and many of the customers in this space are, are medtech. We have a large activity around uh, wireless uh, sensors and uh, particularly around wearable technologies and inertial monitoring. Uh, we have a, r a range of in vitro diagnostic systems based on lab on chip using um, uh, all different processes, uh, uh, etching on silicon, on glass, uh, on injection molding, 3D printing and so on. And then uh, a large activity around electronic integration both in terms of hardware and embedded software. Uh, so we, we leverage those uh, capabilities uh, then towards uh, applications in smart surgical devices, near patient testing, including invasive diagnostics, wearables for continuous monitoring, uh, therapeutic systems, including uh, feedback loop systems, um, cardio neural interfacing and modulation, and more recently in smart manufacturing and industry 4.0 type applications. The core, what we what we do is uh, ICT is our area of excellence. But in this way, we uh, work with the academic uh, principal investigators and centers within Tenzel to deliver uh, excellence uh, of research into impact in the uh, application sectors, working very closely with industry. So our our business model is what we call the ABCD ecosystem. So we work, uh, we collaborate with uh, global medtech and pharma companies, uh, innovative SMEs uh, across the, the Irish landscape, uh, contract manufacturers, uh, leading clinicians, leading scientists and engineers, uh, industrial design partners, and government agencies. And so we, we are not one-stop shop uh, for everything. We recognize what our strengths are. And then uh, typically we would work with uh, business partners uh, and clinical partners to understand the problem statements. And then uh, also working uh, more recently in integrating human uh, factors design into our ecosystem to make sure that whatever we design right from the, uh, the start of the, uh, the discussion is appropriate for the, the, uh, the, the use case scenario. And so what we, what we want to do is end up with novel health and tech solutions with clinical utility and commercial opportunity. And we see the, the big opportunity at the moment based on, on the emerging uh, outcome or value-based uh, healthcare models where 
it is no longer possible uh, to sell the cheapest device uh, and for to the uh, reimbursement agencies. People are now demanding evidence of the efficacy. They're demanding augmented reality for surgical devices. So there's a need to add additional functionality to devices to be able to sense where the uh, device has gone, how, it, how well it has worked, how the patient has recovered afterwards, and so on. So we see a huge opportunity there for uh, the, as the, uh, the, the whole medtech industry globally moves from uh, essentially a precision engineering uh, type uh, business model into um, a smart connected uh, health tech uh, type uh, scenario where reimbursement would be based on, on the, uh, the ability to verify uh, an outcome rather than on selling a product. One of our business models is that uh, what we would describe as living with your customers. So many of our customers uh, who we collaborate with um, choose to uh, have researchers based uh, within Tenbo working on a day-to-day -day basis with the, the, uh, uh, the researchers of Tenbo. We have about 500 people in, in, the, uh, in the institute. Uh, working, as I said, across uh, materials, photonics, electronics, and, and uh, um, uh, microsystems. Uh, and some of these researchers and residents include uh, some of the leading uh, medtech uh, companies, but also some of the leading ICT companies and a number of small SMEs. These are just some examples. I should mention at the outset that I'm not going to uh, disclose uh, our customer list because uh, many of the customers prefer to be anonymous. These are some people that uh, where the information is already in the public domain. We, I'm, I'm only going to give a few examples of um, some of the technologies that we're working on just by way of example. So we started working on smart wearables a number of years ago to develop a smart glove. Uh, for uh, monitoring um, in, the, in the top left picture, this was animation, uh, an avatar to enable stroke rehabilitation. The one on the bottom left was a, a prototype glove which was used for surgical training. And then we have moved into uh, new generations of the device and the most recent is actually for VR gaming. Uh, and this has won uh, uh, a number of prizes nationally and internationally. Uh, to be able to uh, link up with um, augmented reality, but it has numerous op opportunities for the medtech industry, both for uh, um, advanced manufacture and also for different types of training. We also have uh, a variety of different wearable technologies combining uh, uh, motion, uh, electrophysiological, and biochemical sensing platforms that are combined into different types of uh, form factors. In this case, it's a, a system for monitoring knee uh, movements uh, as a means of uh, estimating recovery from procedures such as arthroscopy. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we have several different platforms. This is a biochemical uh, patch platform which combines all of the different building blocks uh, for sensing, uh, for drug delivery, uh, as well as the, the whole uh, system. On the bottom right, you see a micro needle. This is about uh, uh, three to 500 micron in height. And at the tip of this micro needle is an electrochemical sensor, which we use to sense uh, glucose in the interstitial fluid. So this is a wearable platform that can sense biochemical parameters within, uh, the, within, the, within the, uh, the body. So it's a minimally invasive device that could be a smart patch. Uh, another example of the technology that we've worked with um, with a company called uh, a small Irish SME, a company called Fleming Medical, but also uh, incorporating research institutes around Europe uh, and uh, including Philips Research, uh, was a smart dressing system to monitor uh, healing in wound care. And a follow-up project to that uh, we, is led by Philips, Re Philips Research in the Netherlands. And we are, it's a pilot line for uh, smart catheters uh, and guide wires. And we are hosting uh, the, the meeting uh, for this uh, consortium uh, next week here in Tenbo, which will be 45 partners uh, internationally all across Europe and uh, 65 participants. So it ranges from very small projects uh, to very large multinational uh, and multi-partner projects that we collaborate in. 
This is another example of a technology that was originally developed uh, for a European Space Agency. Uh, it's a radiation field effect transistor that was uh, then repurposed uh, to uh, become a, a sensor for monitoring radiotherapy. Uh, then, um, so this, this can take two forms. It's an, either an implantable uh, or a, a wearable dissimilar. The implantable can be used to monitor uh, radiation dosages within the um, uh, within the tumor, and the wearable can is like a personal dissimilar that can be given used to give an instant reading. As I said, we have a large photonics integration capability that allows us to take uh, what would typically be in vitro diagnostic devices move them either through hybrid integration or through monolithic integration into um, uh, miniaturized form factors compatible with implantable and wearable devices. And I'll just give two quick examples of that. One is around, um, again, a company called uh, um, Lake Region Medical, uh, where we were working with them to make a smart guideware as a blood vasodilator system. Uh, so putting uh, essentially uh, a radar-like device at the tip of a guide wire to measure the, the flow of the blood uh, as, it, as the blood flow past the guide wire. Um, and again, you can see that the, because the dimensions are so small, we can really put sensing into any different form factor at this point. Uh, a separate project is more around advanced manufacturing, which is uh, using electrochemical sensors in a spark capsule to monitor um, uh, for, for the pharma industry around bioreactors. And so on that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions later. Thank you very much for this, Dr. Paul. Um, and now, if I may, I'd like to invite Dr. Fionuala, sorry, I'm very sorry, Dr. Fionuala Keen from the Health Research Board, Clinical Research Board in Asian Ireland. Yes, Fionuala. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. Can you hear me there okay? Yes, we can. Great, okay. So um, thank you very much for inviting us to present today. I am Tamila Keane. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for HRB Clinical Research Coordination Ireland. Um, and over the course of my presentation today, I'm going to talk you through um, the uh, capabilities we have in Ireland around clinical research uh, in our hospitals and research centres around the country. So uh, moving to my uh, second slide, um, it, sometimes people get a little bit confused in who our organisations are with all the acronyms that we use uh, in, in clinical research. Um, but the host institution for our programme is Clinical Research Development Ireland. And Clin Clinical Research Development Ireland was formerly known as Molecular Medicine Ireland and they rebranded just over a year ago, actually just a year ago yesterday. Um, and they're a non-for-profit research partnership of the universities around Ireland that have medical schools. And each of these medical schools and, and universities uh, in partnership with the hospitals have clinical research facilities on site at the, at the hospitals, the teaching hospitals, specifically designed for clinical research. CRDI itself is the host organization, as I mentioned, and it is a, it is a central hub organization which acts as, as host institution for a number of different programs and projects specifically in the whole area of clinical research. Moving on to my next slide, clinical research, sorry, I'm sorry, my slides are just moving around there. Okay, right, moving on to my third slide, um, CRDI focuses on supporting clinical research in terms of translational clinical research development, uh, supporting the infrastructure development for clinical research, supporting the delivery of clinical research, and that's very much done through our group in CRDI, supporting education and training, building the capability uh, of Ireland to carry out clinical research across our university partners, and indeed focusing on the funding of clinical research to ensure that we are properly invested in clinical research in Ireland, uh, focusing on the development of our infrastructure. Uh, a little bit more about the programs. As I mentioned to you, CRDI has a number of different programs ongoing. Uh, the ICAP program is a PhD training program for the next set of investigators that are going to run clinical research in Ireland. Curran, as you have already he heard from John, is in partnership here on the education side uh, of, of their program. iPlastics and ICOR are prostate cancer research programs. 
We have a whole group uh, working together on what we call the corporate enabling of clinical research, and that's looking at supporting uh, universities doing academic research primarily, the sponsorship role, the insurance indemnity, all of the things uh, that need to be in place, appropriately in place, to run uh, clinical research at an academic level. And as I mentioned to you, we focus very much on the funding of clinical research, so there's a group uh, collaborating together on the future of re resourcing of clinical research in Ireland. Um, that's a recently uh, set up initiative um, and it really is looking to what we need to put in place in Ireland for the next 10 years to support clinical research. And then we have the recently formed as of last week neonatal encephalopathy PhD training group uh, which are funded through the Health Research Board. And then finally on this list is our group HIV Clinical Research Coordination Ireland and our focus is very much on the support and delivery of clinical trials and uh, studies across Ireland. So moving to the next slide, um, that brings us to um, slide six, which is uh, a jigsaw slide. Um, and you'll notice in our name, uh, the HRB is present, the Health Research Board. And the Health Research Board are funded through the government, the part of the Department of Health funding, uh, and they support clinical research across the island of Ireland. So they support the infrastructure um, and the networks and the, the, the support, support structures that are in place to help clinical research. So this is a jigsaw slide that comes from the Health Research Board. And on the right-hand side, you see the yellow pieces of the jigsaw are, are green and brown. There are the clinical research facilities and centres that are supported and built. There are the physical buildings that are in place and supported through the clinical research. Some are funded directly and some are funded by the universities, but all have an integration and a partnership and, and supporting mechanism there provided to the Health Research Board. On the left hand side, you have the blue piece of the puzzle. These are the uh, therapeutic networks that are currently funded through our national government. Cancer being the primary one that was funded uh, for about the last 20 years. Uh, and in more recent times, in the last three to five years, we have primary care, stroke network, mother and baby, critical care medicine, also funded through the Health Research Board. There are indeed a number of other networks of uh, physicians and those working in clinical research in many other areas of, uh, of health care in Ireland, but these are the ones that are directly supported financially through the Health Research Board. And in the middle then you have two pink pieces. You have the HRB Trial Methodology Research Network on the bottom. They are there to support the in, you know, to support investigators who are developing their own clinical trials uh, to make sure that the methodology is appropriate. And at the top then you have ourselves, HRB Clinical Research Coordination Ireland, and we're here as a connecting piece in the puzzle, puzzle connecting all those who are funded through clinical research in Ireland. Our next slide then, slide seven focuses a little bit more then on the actual partnership that we have in HRB Clinical Research Coordination Ireland. And as of the start of 2017, <coughs> there were seven clinical research facilities in our partnership. Uh, and these centres are located across the country, as I mentioned to you, next to our universities and teaching hospitals. Um, this partnership shows seven, uh, seven uh, centres on the slide. There are actually eight centres. You see we have two centres in the centre in Galway, in St. James's, in Cork, in RCSI, which is the Beaumont Hospital campus also in Dublin, University uh, Hospital, Limerick also have a research centre, and then the National Children's Research Centre in Crumlin. Limerick and Crumlin are the, most, the two most recent uh, partners in, in our group uh, with Limerick just got joining this summer and Crumlin joining last, uh, at the end of last year. Our organisation, our network, as I mentioned to you, is funded through the Health Research Board, but it is also funded uh, in part through Enterprise Ireland and indeed with the support from Clinical Research Development Ireland, the university partnership. Okay, next slide then uh, shows you a little bit more detail about the level of activity and the level of personnel that are available in these clinical research facilities and centres. So looking at the numbers from last, uh, from the end of last year, there were seven centres in the partnership and um, the number of open trial sites at the end of 2017, so these are open clinical trial sites across these centres, was at 237 and you can see uh, looking back to 2014 how much that has grown over these last few years. The experience, the combined years of experience of the people working in these centres currently sits at 67.5 years and obviously that's growing all of the time. 
There are 209 chemical research staff, or there were at the start of 2017, and again, that number is growing all of the time, that work in these centres. And these are people who have dedicated roles specifically to chemical research. So these are uh, research data managers, research nurses, uh, research pharmacists, all of the staff that it takes to run uh, efficiently clinical trials in these centres. The centres are currently working with 18 hospitals uh, scattered around Ireland, so the vast majority of the hospitals that are research ready in Ireland are working with our clinical research facilities and centres. There is research going on within the hospitals that's not part of the clinical research facilities and centres and separate to that, uh, but we in PRCI support all who are doing clinical research across the island of Ireland. And at the moment, or at the end of 2017, there were 333 Irish investigators across many different therapeutic areas who were running trials and working with these clinical research facilities and centres. Coming back to HRB CRCI, the purpose of CRCI is that we provide the infrastructure across Ireland or we support the infrastructure that's in place across Ireland for the delivery of multi-centre clinical trials, be this academic multi-centre clinical trials or commercial large-scale international clinical trials. We here in HRB CRCI act as a central point of contact for academia and industry alike. So when companies want to bring trials to Ireland, they can contact us. We can find sites, find investigators, and connect them with uh, the network uh, and infrastructure that is there to support clinical research. A key focus of what we do in HRB CRCI is to, to ensure that we deliver high quality clinical research across Ireland. Um, and we have a number of different working groups, one in particular working specifically on quality systems to make sure that what we do in all of our centres is to a similar and appropriate standard. And of course, like all of us, we're here to advance the care of patients through this coordinated network. Slide 11 then just talks a little bit more about our services and shows that we provide some of the services in our central office, but we also provide the services across our network at each of our centres. Slide 12 shows you a range of services that we provide. Blue on top are ones that we provide specifically in our central office here, signposting, promoting, advising, consulting, online services, and a whole study feasibility programme, which I'll show you a little bit more about in a moment. These are services we provide directly. And then with our network and with our centres, we provide services around study startup, recruitment, tracking, regulatory and ethics, auditing and monitoring, and indeed, as I mentioned already, quality assurance. A large part of what we do in the central office is also looking at the development of national systems and processes to streamline processes that are already there. So looking at developing templates and different elements uh, and areas of clinical research. As I mentioned to you also, we work with uh, a number of working groups, or we've set up a number of working groups across our networks, which look specifically at particular areas of clinical research to make sure that we're delivering these areas to the best international standards. We have these in quality and working, we have a quality and working group, a study feasibility and startup working group, a budget and costing working group, a legal working group, which looks at the legal templates and standard documents. We have public and patient involvement working group, and we have indeed a pharmacovigilance working group. So we also work in the whole area of uh, paediatric research and in recent times uh, there are a number of European projects ongoing which Ireland are members of and are led out of the central office here, uh, the key one being the C4C Connect for Children program which is running across Europe which we're very involved in. And then if I just uh, give you a, a little bit more detail on the feasibility program, um, this is a service that we provide in HRB CRCI and in partnership with all of our centres around the country. And this is where companies can come to Ireland if they want to do clinical trials or clinical studies, clinical investigations here. They can place their feasibility uh, request with us and we will then feed that out to our network, to our research centres, to our clinical trial therapeutic area networks and directly to investigators. And we gather the information and we get the feasibility completed, we get confidential disclosure agreements in place if needed, we get the paperwork all gathered, the information back, and we see that back as a one-stop shop to the companies interested in doing research here. So instead of companies having to try and find individual investigators themselves, they can come via us and we would provide the information to them uh, with a feedback time of two weeks. <clears throat> to date, this service has processed 197 studies, uh, 34 of those we passed on to the cancer trials network. We don't handle oncology trials here in CRCI at the moment, but we work very closely with Cancer Trials Ireland to handle that, so if an oncology study comes to us, we pass it on directly to Cancer Trials Ireland. The remaining 163 studies we processed through our system 
127 of those studies, Irish investigators said they were interested in participating and 36 they declined. Companies are very often happy for us to let them know when investigators are not interested in participating in trials sooner rather than later, so that that saves them time trying to find out. Of the 127 studies that our investigators were interested in participating, 38 of those are currently proceeding uh, to opening uh, and studies that will be happening in Ireland. That's a 23% success rate on feasibility, and on average you expect a success rate of about 10% on feasibility, so we're tracking well ahead of that here at the moment. At the time these slides were prepared in June, there were five, <coughs> five ongoing assessments at the time. 33 studies uh, Ireland was declined for, so the company said, well, no, that isn't actually, we're not going to go with Ireland for whatever reason. 49 studies uh, were not proceeding, so studies that the companies had thought about running, they looked to the feasibility and then decided to change the study. And two were in, categorized here as not applicable because they're not actual research studies, they're more uh, surveys. Moving on into the next slide, uh, those who are using our service, so at the moment we see 57% of the studies are coming to Ireland through the, clinic, uh, the CROs, the Contract Research Organisation, 6% through Clinical Research Network, and 37% through the pharmaceutical industry. So you can see there's a good spread uh, of uh, you know, supply of studies coming uh, from the, the entire industry that's there at the moment. Also, we just wanted to point out that Ireland, is, as was mentioned in the first presentation this morning, is the only English-speaking country on the edge of Europe. We feel that it is really important for us to be well integrated to Europe, giving access uh, to Ireland and others to the rest of Europe. Um, and so Ireland are hoping to join the European Clinical Research Infrastructure Network later this year. It's actually with our government at the moment. It needs to be approved by government uh, before we can act, uh, participate. Um, and that's uh, in, in the, with the cabinet for discussions at present. And we hope to be joining before the end of the year. This will give Ireland full membership and access to the European-wide network of clinical research. And so then for trials and studies that we carry out here in Ireland, we have greater access to the network that's available across Europe uh, to, to carry out those studies further afield. And that's the last of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, during the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Dr. Fionuela. And um, with this, I will hand over to Dr. Tom Melvin from the Health Products Regulatory Authority. And after that, um, we will open up for questions. I've already started receiving a few. We welcome other participants to send in their questions. Thank you. Dr. Melvin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tanaz, and good afternoon, everyone, and, and good morning to uh, the, the callers from Ireland. Um, Tom Melvin is my name. I'm a medical officer with the Irish regulator, HPRA, um, and I guess we're the regulatory authority for devices and, and other healthcare products. Um, so thank you to um, Tanaz and the IDA team for inviting me today. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is maybe just give a, a regulatory perspective on, on device innovation and the kind of supports that we have in HPRA. Um, so you can see the agenda there. We'll discuss maybe a regulatory perspective on device innovation. Um, I guess you may have heard that we've had a, a, a new regulation published in the last year, and we'll introduce that and, I guess, a, a couple of the highlighted changes um, that that regulation will bring. And then, I guess, maybe towards the end, we can focus in on some of the HPRA supports um, for device innovators and the kind of facilities that we can offer. Um, so uh, I guess this first slide is just to show that um, in a European system, um, we're decentralized. So I guess the coordination is a very important thing, and it's something that um, HPRA recognizes as an important aspect of our regulatory activity. Um, so we're, we're very engaged with working with other um, member states and authorities and with the European Commission to um, help policy and, and guideline development, uh, as well as the new um, regulation implementation at the moment. Um, this slide is just to give you a, a sense of our, I guess, timeline and scope. Um, so we've been responsible for medical device regulation for about 18 years now. Um, previously, this was under the responsibility of the Department of Health directly. Um, and on the slide, hopefully you can see the text um, clearly. Um, there's a range of other healthcare products that we regulate in HPRA also, I guess, medicinal products, but also um, human products or scientific animal protection or cosmetics. 
Um, so we have quite a, a broad scope as a regulatory authority. Um, and I guess this slide is just to introduce, I guess, in a snapshot, what the role of HPRA is in, in this regulatory system. Um, I guess it's important maybe to highlight that as a regulatory authority or what the law calls a competent authority, we're not a, a notified body or we don't allow market access or CE marking for devices. And um, that's something that falls under the responsibility of a, a separate set of bodies known as notified bodies, and there's 55 of those in Europe. Um, but I guess as you'll see in the slide there, um, in HPRA, we, we have quite a broad scope in terms of oversight of the functioning of the system. So we would do things like um, manufacturer sites, or we would designate the, the notified bodies and the people who can apply CE marks and, and give them uh, the legal designation to do that. Um, and we also look at, I guess, devices in the pre-market phase, um, and I guess this would apply uh, more to innovation and, and new devices where we approve um, what's called clinical investigations or the legal term for a trial of a medical device. Um, in the post-market, then we would also do market surveillance and we would look after safety issues or vigilance reporting, um, so safety reporting for marketed devices. And, and I guess these next two slides are just, I guess, to highlight the um, massive transformation uh, that medical device technology has, has brought about. Um, I, I guess in uh, medical devices, we have hundreds of thousands of medical devices now available in Europe, and the number um, is far greater than the number of medicinal products available. And I guess it's something that is um, uh, it's, it's very interesting to watch, I guess, the different ways that device innovation is happening, and I guess the ways that um, the armament of doctors is, is being uh, improved all the time by uh, medical devices and the, the treatment options that they bring for patients. Um, so I guess in this next part, I was going to just uh, focus in on a couple of aspects of device innovation and, and what makes device innovation perhaps different to other healthcare products like, uh, for example, drugs. Um, one of the, the main things with medical devices is that they develop by what you could call iteration. Um, so often you will have small changes made, um, maybe to the materials of the device or the size or, um, you know, for the example we have here. And this is a graph um, from the New England Journal of Medicine to show how pacemakers have evolved since they were first um, implanted and used in 1958, where you had uh, wires that were at tunnels and, and placed externally on the heart, and those wires then passed to a quite a large box that sat on someone's belt. Um, in the 1960s, uh, they developed uh, completely implantable pacemakers, um, so there was no wires or, or nothing running externally. Um, and over the decades, there was lots and thousands of changes in terms of the size of the box, the batteries, the software, the wires, and the connections. Um, so I guess these are all iterative changes. Um, in 2016, then, I guess there was what you could call a disruptive change um, in that there was the development of completely implantable pacemakers. So instead of being uh, wired and, and tunneled, um, uh, there was uh, devices which can be placed um, inside the chambers of the heart. Um, and this is an interesting uh, aspect of medical device innovation in that you can have small iterative changes, which sometimes and over time lead to uh, significant changes with devices, but you can also have disruptive changes, and, and innovation is, I guess, the, the way in which these things happen. Um, this slide is, I guess, just to, to highlight some of the kind of emerging technologies, and, and you would have heard from the, the previous speakers um, the spread of investigations and, and uh, research that's happening in Ireland, and this is just to give you one or two um, highlights. Um, so you can see that image on the left is a wearable sensor, um, and you can see the kind of um, potential uses that sensors like that may have. For example, um, pregnant women could use them to monitor for contractions, which might allow patients to be appropriately cared for in a home environment rather than a hospital environment. Um, in the image on the right, you'll see um, a, a 3D printed um, stent, which is used for a condition called tracheomalacia, when someone's windpipe tends to collapse. Um, and this was previously a, a disease 
that was treated by using quite invasive masks to keep a positive airway pressure. And I, I guess by innovation and by the use of multiple types of technologies, it's possible to create completely new treatment options for what you could perhaps call underserved um, diseases. Um, this next slide is, I guess, just to highlight um, the fact that innovation um, is not just with medical devices, but also with in vitro diagnostics. Um, and in Europe, um, the uh, legislation uh, for in vitro diagnostics came into force for the first time in 1998 in a directive. And again, last year, as part of the new regulations that were published, there was one for medical devices and, and one for IVD devices. Um, so I guess maybe just to focus in um, for a moment on uh, the uh, change that we've had from the directive to the new regulation. Um, so you, uh, I guess just as a, as a snapshot, and I guess we could talk about this for a lot longer than 15 minutes, we moved from having a, a number of directives in Europe to having two regulations. And I guess uh, there's a number of changes that are significant. Um, I guess firstly, uh, we moved from having uh, quite short directives, which had uh, about 20 articles, to quite large legislative text with 123 articles um, and a, a, an increase in the number of annexes. So I guess the size of the regulation is one of the most striking things that you'll first see. So what's in the content of the new regulations? Um, well, I guess, as it's mentioned in the middle column there, I guess the, the legal basis changed. Um, so I guess in a snapshot, a directive is a a menu of items to be achieved by each of the 28 member states in Europe, whereas a regulation applies equally across all member states. Um, but I guess what's gone into that increase in content in the regulation is that a large number of uh, aspects of things which were previously contained in uh, ISO standards or in consensus guidance documents that are published by the European Commission, something that we call MedDev documents, a lot of that was incorporated into the text of the regulation and given a legislative footing. So I guess it's important to remember that although we've um, greatly expanded the amount of regulation that we have, it wasn't a, a completely a new approach or a complete change. It was essentially taking a, a large number of things from what were seen as being best practice. Um, and I guess with the new regulations, there was also uh, something of a change in scope um, Previously, there were two directives for devices. There was an active implantable directive and a general medical device directive, um, which were taken under one regulation. And we also, for the first time in Europe, started to regulate devices which don't have a medical purpose. Um, so things like non-corrective contact lenses and there's five other product groups. Um, you'll see those in Annex 16 of the new regulation. Um, and I guess, although we don't have time to go into a, a huge amount of detail, um, I've put up the, the text from the very first preamble of the new medical device regulation. Um, and I guess the, the key thing to note here is that the, the purpose of the new regulation is to maintain what was essentially the same balance that we had with the directives, which is to try to ensure a high level of, of safety and health while supporting innovation. Um, and I guess this graph is just to show, uh, I guess, a, a number of the um, aspects important to clinical data and clinical evidence that we use uh, in Europe. Um, with the new regulation, we have a, a definition of clinical data now taken into the, the regulation, um, which mentions uh, scientific and peer-reviewed um, journals and, and other sources of clinical data. Uh, clinical investigations is the, the term we use in Europe to describe a, a study of a device in human subjects. Um, and then a very important part of medical device regulation is having an appropriate balance between the kind of data you get before you enter the market and the kind of data that you collect once on the market. Um, and the way that you bring all of that evidence together is what we, in what we call a clinical evaluation uh, in Europe. Um, so I guess in this next section, um, I'll maybe just introduce a, a couple of the specific supports that we have in HPRA um, for medical device develop, developers and, and for innovators. 
and, and I guess it's important to note that this is something that HPRA see as a, as a key part of our overall approach to how we support uh, regulation. Um, and I guess the, the three things you'll see in this graph, um, just to introduce them, I guess the first is the Innovation Office, and this is something which was started in HPRA about two years ago, um, where we set up a, an independent office within the organization that works across all of the different products that we regulate, and it's set up essentially to provide support to innovators, uh, not just for devices, but for any kind of healthcare products. And we have a system whereby queries can be submitted by a, via an online application, and uh, the Innovation Office then work with the appropriate people in-house in HPRA to provide that support. Um, there's a couple of specific supports that we've developed over the last couple of years uh, in HPRA for clinical investigations, and um, we'll introduce them uh, in the next slide. Um, and I guess finally it's important to note that we also have a, a specific way to get um, support for understanding the new regulations um, by a, a specific email address and by information on our website, which we'll be um, adding to over the coming months and years to, to help people to understand the new regulations and, and the most important aspects uh, relating to them. So I guess in this slide, we just introduce the um, kind of supports that we have for clinical investigations. And um, I guess there are two main kinds of meetings that we offer to people. Um, and we're very aware in HPRA that device developers are often um, thought leaders or experts in the kind of technologies that they're studying and researching and developing, but they don't necessarily have a, a complete understanding of, of regulatory requirements or the way that the system works. And we're very happy in HPRA to, to help to support those um, innovators by, I guess, introducing the regulatory requirements in general, explaining how the system works, and helping them to understand what the regulatory requirements might be. And uh, I guess in terms of the feedback we get from device developers, they tend to find it very helpful, I guess, to understand and to help incorporate into their development pathway um, what are some of the important regulatory um, things to consider. I guess the second kind of meeting that we offer is uh, what we call a pre-submission meeting. And these tend to be for uh, device innovators who have, um, I guess, gotten a little further in terms of their development and they understand the, the general kind of study that they would like to run. And I guess this is a way for the HPRA and the uh, innovators to come together, I guess, to discuss in general the study design, uh, the kind of uh, important aspects that they might need to consider, and I guess to, to help in a less formal way to discuss a potential study and then in the 60-day process that we have for reviewing clinical investigation applications. Um, I, I guess it's important to note that, that there's no cost for these meetings and we try to keep them as informal as possible. And again, I guess for, for these kind of meetings, the feedback is, is generally very positive. Um, so I, I guess that's the patient, um, and I'm very happy to, to take any, any questions that any of you might have, and, and thank you again for having me. Thank you very much for this, Tom. And um, with this, we're, we open up the floor for question and answer session. Um, we've got about 15 minutes at hand, but I've already received loads of questions. In no particular order, I will start the question for Paul. Is there a testing facility available in Tindall in for startups? Yeah, so we, it depends on, uh, the question isn't sufficiently detailed because we do have electronic and photonic testing and also material testing. Uh, so uh, we do have those facilities. Uh, I'm not sure if that is what is required by the, the, the person asking the question. For this, I would request the, uh, the person who posed this question, if they'd like, they can email us on um, either of the email addresses put up on the screen right now. If you can give us a brief about which area your interest lies in, we can probably run this past Paul again and get a more detailed response. Um, moving on, I have a question for both Kuram and Tindal. So maybe we will let um, we will let John answer this first, and Paul, you can add to it if it's any different. The question is. Do you have a list of existing technology available for commercial exploitation, and what would be the system, I guess, what would be the process uh, 
for the same. Okay, and yes, the answer is... Are the is existing. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah no, there's no problem. We are just um, completing uh, the research. We have the researchers doing all the business plans and feasibilities on 71 projects. Uh, we hope to um, have a... Um, or over the next five weeks, we hope to have a list of technologies of maybe 20 to 30 projects that we'll be offering to our existing partners and also to uh, to industry. So uh, over the next four or five weeks, the answer is yes. We will have uh, full projects available that we have the intellectual property on that we can share definitely. So uh, if we have that information, and the company in hand will we'll certainly share um, any areas of, that they have of interest. We can try and match them up with some of the projects or send them a general list if that's what they require. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this is yeah. good, but um, uh, would this be a list that would be uh, maybe available online, or is this someone writes into you with their area yeah, of interest? Really, well, we would, we would normally select companies that had a specific um, interest in a bespoke area. Um, the partners that we have already, we would know um, basically what their key uh, areas of research, if they're sepsis, cancer, um, oncology, or Parkinson's. But uh, if we know the background of the individual company, the type of area that they have of interest, uh, if it's in within the medical device, as I mentioned, there's probably up to 30 different areas, so I'm sure there would be several there that we could share if that is required. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, thank you, John. Okay. Paul, may I request okay. you to take this forward? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just a very quick comment on that. Uh, from our experience, uh, the best approach is actually uh, uh, for the company to engage, uh, and we do this all the time under CDA to if they can share at least some aspects of their problem statements, then uh, we can uh, more efficiently uh, identify the most appropriate technology uh, that the company is looking for to, to provide the solution. Uh, it, we have many different technologies, uh, many of which are available, but uh, as you can appreciate, uh, it can be quite complex to uh, uh, share those lists because in some cases certain fields of use are excluded because of licenses to other uh, third parties and so on. So the most efficient way is uh, if the company can share a problem statement under NDA as applicable and then we can identify uh, the most appropriate solution uh, that we can provide. Or in many cases we identify uh, other partners uh, that can provide uh, the most appropriate solution external to ourselves. Got that. Thank you. Um, I now have one for Dr. Tom Melvin, and this one is around what are the key initiatives to maintain medtech product supply post-Brexit? Will the company need to take, will need another license to operate from Ireland into the EU post-Brexit? Um, thanks, Tanaz. I, I guess that's a a question that I guess there's probably no instant or easy answer for, I guess, because Brexit is, is I guess, still subject to negotiation. Um, in general, um, and as a HPRA approach, um, I guess we, Brexit is certainly a, a topic of interest to us. And I, I guess, as you mentioned in the question there, ensuring a continued supply of necessary um, medical devices and I guess all healthcare products that we're responsible for is a, is a very important priority for us. Um, I guess in, in terms of what HPRA can do in terms of support for ensuring that devices continue to be available, um, I guess what I would say is to keep an eye on our website. We, we currently have a, a page with all of the HPRA information um, on it, and I guess that will uh, continue to be updated um, over the course of the coming months. I guess in terms of the um, specific regulatory aspects to take into account, um, I guess you'll see some of the, the comment on our website, but also I guess ensuring that um, a, a clear plan is in place for um, the aspects um, of our regulatory system, um, such as notified body uh, designation and availability um, for those that are in the United Kingdom, and also for manufacturers based in the United Kingdom. Um, so I guess these are things where 
it's very difficult to give a, a short and um, snappy answer, um, but I guess there is some information on our website and, and we'll continue to provide further updates um, as we can. Thank you for this. This helps us as well because in the course of uh, you know, our normal work meeting with companies, this does come up quite often, especially as we get closer to Brexit. Um, moving on, I've got about five questions for IDA. Um, the broad synopsis is uh, these are, there are two, three startups in, in various areas and they want to know how could they go about setting up an office in Ireland and what are the benefits available for them. Someone else wants to know more about the R&D grant available and, um, yeah, about marketing in, in Ireland. Given these are four IDA, may I please skip these for now and request um, uh, those that have posed these questions to, again, write in or call the numbers on the screen, and we'd be happy to d discuss this with you one-on-one. -on -one. The, the answer is yes, we will be able to assist you. Yes, um, there will be benefits coming your way, but let us discuss this um, separately. Um, moving on, we've got one for um, Fionuala, and this is for Indian companies intending to do clinical trials for their products in Ireland, is there a national register of healthy volunteers or patients that they can tap into, the company can tap into? So unfortunately at the moment we don't have a national register of patients or of healthy volunteers. Uh, on a broad scale. We do, in some individual therapeutic areas, have national registries, for example, in, in cancer areas and in some other areas like cystic fibrosis or um, epilepsy. There are a number of different smaller registries in place. We do, however, have quite you know, a, a, small, a relatively small population uh, working out of you know, a tight number of hospitals and research centers. So while we may not have registers, we do have access to uh, the vast majority of the patient population through the number of hospital staff uh, are seeing patients in Ireland and treating patients and carrying out research. And um, we do also have a very willing population, uh, an open population for clinical research. So while we may not have a registry in place, uh, we find that Ireland is a very good and welcoming place uh, to do clinical research with people very willing to participate, uh, be they healthy volunteers or patients. Right. Thank you for that. Um, with this, we've got some questions which are kind of repetitive. Um, we've covered those. So with this, I'd like to draw this webinar to a close. Again, to answer the companies, for all those companies that have written in, um, inquiring about their interest. So yes, we will help you. Um, we will help you find the right area within Ireland to set up in. Why you should share information on why you should be setting up in Ireland. Uh, introduce you to the ecosystem. And um, sorry, give me just a minute. A question just come in. Sorry, I'd like to bring this up. And this is around um, addressed to both Tyndall and Kuram. The question is if there is a company that like that would like to tap into your existing network of companies or projects you're working on is there a mechanism to do so and if i may request paul to take this forward and then maybe john sorry yes please sorry do you, yeah. do you want me or paul sorry paul please go ahead yeah, I, I think we'd probably end up uh, both giving the same answer anyway. And, and the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, I, it, but each each uh, inquiry would be case specific, and obviously we would need to uh, understand what the problem statement is, what the company would like to achieve. Obviously, we have to respect uh, the the integrity of our collaborations with the other partners. Uh, so we would need to get agreement from them and so on. But in principle, we do this all the time where we uh, provide uh, solutions which include setting up the value chain uh, ranging from, in our case, the components and the materials right up to, to the contract manufacturers, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, uh, the industrial design as well, and, and, uh, and even uh, linking people with the, the relevant clinic, clinicians, clinical research facility, and so on. So we try to provide that uh, solution which includes uh, the value chain 
uh, as applicable, and we do this all the time. So the, the quick answer is yes, but it's a very case-specific uh, scenario that we would need to discuss. Thank you. And John? Yeah, no, it's exactly, Paul, it's exactly it's 100% the same system. We need to know case-specific, uh, review the, the, uh, the key requirement to see does it match uh, our our protocol and our procedure and can we uh, um, integrate it into our system and if we can, as long as we sign the various documents and we can review it, uh, we certainly can do that. But it is case specific and uh, it, it, we need to see does it relate into our existing product profile and it doesn't conflict with any other partnerships that we have ongoing at present. All right. All right. Noted. Thank you very much. Thank you to okay. each one of you who spoke today. Thank you also to every one of you who signed in to know more about Ireland and the opportunities, research opportunities within Ireland. We are open to any kind of questions, comments from you, and look forward to engaging with each of you, speakers and participants. Thank you very much, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. so much.